programme is brought to you by UCL, London's global university. It really does support this venture and how our, our team are massively excited by this venture. I'll be followed at the end of, of this session, I think, by our Vice Provost for Health, Sir John Took, who there he is, who will, who will also say a few words. So I think the, you've had the Provost, the Vice Provost and the Dean all, all will be emphasising their support for what is a very, very exciting venture and I, I think that shows just how core to, to the way we see things at UCL this, this is. I want to congratulate Fares, um, Peter, Monty and lots and lots of other people who've made this happen very quickly and very effectively. Uh, it, the, the, the speed of this development and the way it's development, developing really bodes well and congratulations also on putting together such an exciting and informative meeting today. It's terrific. Biomedicine at UCL is one of the biggest centres in, in biomedicine in Europe and also one of the most successful by most outputs you can measure. And we pride ourselves on our multidisciplinary approach that crosses from the most challenging basic science through translational research to clinical care and then partners with all of our hospitals including UCLH and, and I mention that particularly because this venture really does pull together all aspects of that multidisciplinary approach. You can, you, I won't go through all the different disciplines that are here, you know what they are, all the different approaches from clinical approaches to basic science. It really is an astonishing array and it also reflects very well UCL's grand challenges, which I suspect many of you will know about. In fact, it just, there, there are four grand challenges for society that UCL has embraced. And I think that in one way or another, this venture can play a part in all of them. One, of is, one is human well-being. Another one is global health. Another one is intercultural interaction. And the other one is sustainable cities. And you know, there are things we've heard about this morning that in every single one of those, this new institute and venture can play a great part. The other thing that we pride ourselves on is collaboration and working together acro across boundaries. And, and yet again, this, uh, this venture exemplifies that. So I'm, I'm um, enormously excited. I can assure you that the Faculty of Biomedicine and UCL more broadly will be supporting this, as I know will UCLH, and I do wear a hat which crosses the boundary between UCLH as the director of the Comprehensive Biomedical Research Centre at UCLH and UCL, and I'm pleased to be able to just uh, mention that the CBRC has invested already in this institute. I'm sure that UCLH, UCL, and it would be wrong of me not to mention UCL Partners, the partnership of other hospitals that we, we work with, will be supporting this venture financially, in terms of space, in terms of supporting the staff, and in any other ways that it needs to go forward. So many, many congratulations to the team of people that have put this meeting together in the Institute. I wish it lots of luck in, in the future, and I can assure you of the support of myself and our team at UCL. Thank you, Ferris. I will be now co-chairing the next session with uh, Professor Monty Mython and uh, this session is moving the other way really, all about delivering our potential and delivering Olympic gold. Like all the other speakers today, the introductions are very easy. All of you know Professor Hugh Montgomery, he's a TV star, he's an author, he's Professor of Intensive Care and he's also the uh, Director of the Institute of uh, Performance and Human Health at the Whittington and UCL and uh, Hugh's going to tell us about some work he's been doing for the last 15 years on the genetic basis of performance. Good. Well, I'll reiterate uh, my thanks uh, for the offer to speak and my enthusiasm because I think this it really is a massive opportunity and it, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, genetic terms of sporting ability. Um, I'm going to assume there's no one in the audience that knows anything about genetics um, because that's usually a good place to start. So here is your genome with its chromosomes in pairs. And essentially it comprises around 20,000 genes. The number sort of oscillates depending on what you define as a gene. And that's around 6 billion base pairs, so it's a pretty chunky uh, bit of code. And small variations in that code are important. It's the common inheritance that's uh, essential 20,000 genes that makes us all human, but it's small variations in it that accounts for the differences between us. 
Um, rather spurious, if you're looking at exon coding sequences, we share about 22% of our genome with a banana. Um, you are about 31% the same as a cabbage. Uh, you're 97% in exon coding sequences, the same as a chimpanzee, and generally you can tell the difference between uh, your colleagues and the lower primate, although it can be tricky. And between humans, again, the differences between us, it's the variation in that genetic uh, copy that makes us all different from each other in this room and different from anyone who's ever lived before or anyone who will ever live in the future. And those variations come in a number of different flavors. There are these things called CNVs, copy number variation, very sexy just at the moment. It's fine. It turns out that genes have become replicated, copied multiple times over our evolutionary history. And that seems to affect their function in really quite important ways. Mutations get the story in the press. Those are, by definition, variants that are less common, less than 1%. And that's the ones that people talk about usually where a mutation causes disease, the gene for a particular disease. But of course most of our genetic variant doesn't cause one thing. Most of it is polymorphic variation. By definition, uh, a variant that's common more than 1% of the population carry. And polymorphic variation, as we'll see, is really very common indeed. It can happen in the coding area, so it can change the protein that you're making from a gene. It can uh, be variation in the regulator areas, the sort of break, accelerator and clutch of each gene affecting its responsiveness, and actually also the engagement of that clutch in RNA stability, whether the engine just turns over in a rather futile way, or whether it produces product at the back end. And the most common of these polymorphic variations are known as SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So this is a change in one letter of the code sequence at an important site. And they really are common. Um, we're probably up to beyond 10 million identified SNPs now, and they crop up roughly around one in 300 bases. So this really is very common. Now, of course, it's not all down to genes. We should make that very, very clear, as Richard was goading me earlier on, you know, that the world is, is not determined entirely by genetics, because it is both. The way you are depends upon your genes you carry and the environment to which you expose them. So you may well have the genes that give you the capability to be a six foot nine basketball player, but if you're malnourished in the womb or you're malnourished as a child, you'll still end up being four foot nine. It's got to be the combination of the two. Now it turns out, I'm not going to dwell on these things, it turns out we've now got really pretty powerful ways of exploring genetic contributions. And that's important because it helps us understand the way we are. It helps us understand the physiology. And you can do these things called candidate association studies, so candidate gene studies, where you look at the rat data, the um, cell data, reckon that you know what the system is likely to be in a human, choose the gene that's key in that system, choose a genetic variant, and associate it. And you can apply those things um, very, very powerfully. So one example here, this gene we'll talk about shortly, ACE and left ventricular growth. We could identify a role for ACE in causing cardiac growth in humans in response to exercise with a sample of 61 military recruits going through basic training. So you don't need big numbers for training-related investigations. And finally, the, the firepower that can be brought to bear now is huge. It turns out that of those 10 million single nucleotide polymorphisms, a lot of them travel together. They're sort of like coaches on the train. You can identify one seat. You know what all the other seats were that come in that coach. And these things are called haplotype blocks. So you don't really have to look at all 10 million. You can look at perhaps 1 million, and it will tell you about most of the variation in the genome. And that's cheap now. Uh, you can do that for, well, 10 years ago, it would cost us £26 to look at one gene variant. You can now look at 1.1 million gene variants for 300 quid, um, and we're being able to buy options on sequencing the whole human genome for the same price in two years' time. So we're in a situation now where we've got the firepower to apply. The question for today, then, is whether those small variations, uh, as they affect every other phenotype, could affect sporting performance. And I'm going quickly because I want to gather a little bit more time, but the answer evidently is yes. Um, here's one of the earlier papers, 1996, showing really quite profound contributions of genetic variation to overall differences in 
reaction time, speed, flexibility, and so forth. And some of these things are much more powerfully influenced. If you look at children under the age of 12, around 82% of their variation in their waist measurements is genetic. So that's not to say that eating lots of donuts doesn't make you fat. It's just across a population, um, the genetic contribution to that variation that counts is about 80% of the variation. How is, of course, um, multifactorial. So the first thing is actually that genetics does contribute to whether you choose to exercise at all. So you're partly influenced to being a couch potato, or as some people in this room are, you know, pathological exercises, just because of the genes you've got. And if you compare monozygotic twins, who of course share essentially an almost identical genome, to dizygotic, who share half their genes, but raised in the same environments, you find very, very strong heritability for whether you take a walk after a meal, whether when you get to the stairs the lift, you wait for the lift or you're prepared to take the stairs, whether when you find a shop, you go round and round and round in a car to park outside or whether you're happy to park up the road and walk. All of those things that you would be surprised by being genetic are indeed strongly genetically influenced. The way we are um, in terms of our body structure, bone mineral density, lean muscle mass, these things are also strongly genetically determined. And it's no surprise, is it? If you remember the playground, there were very muscly kids, there were the lean and lanky ones, and they were like that from when they were really quite young. Therefore, functions affected. So if you look at speed, force, muscle bulk, again, very strongly genetically influenced. And that's prior to training. Other genes will influence your response to training. So if you then got the propensity to do well or perhaps be strong and the genes that make you want to exercise, there's another set of genes that influence how you respond. Some of those genes fall into the same cluster as those affected pre-training performance. Others are a separate cluster. They determine how you respond. And around 20% of the change is independent of the genes um, that influence your pre-training. And that's important because it means if you're trying to use genetics to identify athletes, as some people are now in the world, you still need to see how they respond. You can't just do it by screening a whole lot of school children uh, if all you're looking at is baseline. Uh, we know things, uh, you know, for those of you that are sports exercise scientists, VO2 max is a very powerful um, factor in regulating some elite performance. And we know a lot of that is heritable. And a good measure of that heritability is, is coming through the maternal line, which rather fingers the mitochondrial genome as being of importance, which perhaps isn't a surprise. Anyway, one could go on. There'll be genes that affect lung size, lung structure, alveolar volume, blood vessels, VQ matching, the muscles that make your chest move, the respiratory drive. There'll be ones affect the heart size, chamber size, contractility, inotropic response in the sympathetic nervous system. There'll be red blood cell mass, number, volume, uh, hemoglobin variants, um, macronutrients, whether you're absorbing enough iron. There's the fuels, your fat stores, your thyroid hormone, your insulin, your glucose, and a thousand and one other things. So as we all know, elite athletes are complex beasts, and you can't finger any one element and say it'll be because they've got great lungs. Elite athletes have a package of many, many factors of influence. Briefly taking you through one story by way of exemplar is some work that we've been doing now, uh, as uh, was alluded to by Faris, probably for, he's being generous, it's probably more than 15 years now, um, on this system. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, this is the circulating or endocrine renin angiotensin system. And all you really need to recognize is this stuff, angiotensin 1, which is a decapeptide, gets two amino acids clumped off by this enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, to make this octopeptide, which puts your blood pressure up. It shuts down blood vessels, and it makes your kidneys hang on to salt and water. So important for that, it was said. But we now know, and have known really for the last 20 years, that these systems are evolutionarily ancient. They've been found in locusts and elasmobranchs and jellyfish. You can find variations of them in plants, and you can find them in every single human cell and organ system in the body, whether it be ovaries or testes, hair follicles, fat, brain, liver, muscle, um, everywhere. And they do important things. They regulate cell growth, 
inflammation and metabolism, amongst many other things. It's the only genetic slide I'm going to show you. That's the ACE gene. Here's one of the variants. There are 127 known variations that are common in this gene. There's one of them, and it consists of either the presence or absence of a little extra chunk of DNA. Now, you've all got two ACE genes in this audience, and each of those genes could be an insertion variant where you've got a little extra bit there, which means you've got low ACE activity, all that bit's missing, and you've got high. And the genes are equally frequent. So 25% of you here today have two I versions of the gene and have low ACE activity. 50% of you in this audience will have an I and a D and have middle ACE. And 25% of you will be like me and have two D versions with high levels of ACE activity. Cutting a long story short, it influences cardiac growth with exercise, very profoundly, threefold differences across genotypes if you train and how much your heart grows. It also influences performance. So this was a study of a small number, again, you don't need big numbers for these studies, of military recruits with their heels, bums, backs to the wall, and it's a standard metronome fatigue test. 15 kilo barbell, metronome goes ping, they have to pick it up with no swinging. Metronome goes ping, they lower it down. The metronome gets faster and faster, and when they start swinging, when they can't lift it, or when they can't keep up, the clock stops. Here's the time in seconds, starting at 100 seconds, and the first bar, this is by genotype II, ID, and DD. The first bar is pre-training, and if I put the error bars on, you'd find there's no statistical difference before training at all. After six weeks of basic military training for these recruits, UIIs in the audience have already gained a minute. The IDs are at 40 seconds. We DDs are lagging behind there with 20 seconds gain. And at the end of 10 weeks of training, UIIs in the audience have doubled your exercise time from 100 to 200 seconds. The IDs are still up there with 40 seconds. And if I put the error bars on there, you'd find that we DDs were no statistically better at the end of training than we were to start with, which is my excuse. And these are work, uh, this work I did actually some years ago with Richard uh, Budget, I think our first paper together, looking at Olympic uh, gold medal, uh, sorry, gold passport holders essentially. So elite long distance runners, or elite runners. And if you look at the I allele frequency, so it should be 0.5, half the genes in the pool ought to be I versions, you find that the prevalence of those I versions increases as the distance you compete at regularly goes up. So there seems to be some advantages, and stressing the point, this isn't the gene for being an endurance runner. There are plenty of DDs who run at 5,000 meters. It's just there is an association. It is a factor that tracks. And I'm not going to steal Mike's thunder, because Mike's going to be talking about hypoxic training. But part of the reason this gene is having its effect is it affects efficiency of use of oxygen. So here are you in the audience, 25% of you IIs, 25% DDs. Here are elite mountaineers with this great shove towards the IIs. Um, it's not surprising I struggle on high mountains and I don't know genuinely what Mike's genotype is but I'll bet you he's in here because he walks up mountains like it's a park. And it makes a difference. Uh, I did this study with uh, Georgios Tianos who was one of our PhD students who sat at the Goutet hut on the way up to the summit of Mont Blanc, took some DNA off people as they set off the summit and when they came down he said, did you get to the top? All the IIs get to the top, and around 12% of us DDs don't get to the top. And we've repeated that with Julian Thompson in 8,000 metre peaks and so forth. For the more observant amongst you, you'll say, well, if the II, if the I allele frequency is meant to be 0.5, it's not 0.5 here, it's too low. Or put the other way, there's an excess of the D allele in the sprinters. And indeed you find that. This is work we did with the Russians from St. Petersburg, looking at all of their, this was nearly 2,400 uh, elite Russian and ex-Soviet uh, international competitors. And again, if you're looking at the sprinters, this great push towards DD genotype compared to the controls, or those that rather athletes who are not sprint athletes. Swimming turns out to be predominantly a power-related sport, actually. And again, you find the same thing, that if you look at the short-distance swimmers compared to the nutcases who do 30-kilometer races in the sea, 
again, a very strong push among swimmers towards the DD genotype. And just briefly, and it is worth us mentioning, this isn't just about getting the gold medals. This does relate to real life too. So if you look at elderly people, we all know we lose sarcomeric mass. And as you get older, I remember that being my, for the case of my, both my father and mother before they died. They ate well, they were still walking on Dartmoor, but their muscles just got progressively weaker. And they found it harder and harder to get out of the chairs. And actually, the preservation of strength does seem to track with genotype. And you find the same thing if you look at patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, where actually a lot of the physical problems that patients have doesn't relate to lungs, it relates to the fact their muscles don't work anymore. And again, DD is preserving quadriceps strength. This study was done with Nick Hopkinson at the Brompton. So I'm trying to build a case for the fact that looking at genes isn't just about selecting super athletes. It can translate that from military recruits and athletes into people who smoke too much or people who are just getting on in years. Now, I've given you one exemplar, but of course it comes down to multiple genes, as we've said before. So again, this is a study we published, um, I think, two years ago now with the Russians. Um, having looked at the ten major hits that there were out at the time, um, we'd identified four genes that were strongly associated, and there were six others that seemed to be associated with sporting phenotypes. Um, what we've done here is looking at power athletes, mixed elite, non-elite, short distance endurance. These are different sorts of categories of sport, starting with non-elite going up to sub-elite, going up to basically Olympic medal winners. And we're looking at the prevalence of having all 10 of those advantageous um, genotypes. And not surprisingly, in every discipline, the more elite you are, the more likely you are to have got that rather unusual combination of 10 genes. So the Beckhams of the world are unique. Part of that will be their environmental upbringing. Part of it will just be that they are very unusual because they inherited a really weird cluster of genes that most of us have not inherited. I've dropped in these slides. These are new data which we'll be publishing with Ken and Mike and Marco shortly. Um, We've been interested in kinins, just to say you can carry this through to other areas. So this is a study, again, of recruits looking at bone mineral density in different areas of the lower limb, essentially showing that genotypes that mark high kinin activity are associated with substantial differences in bone mineral density. And we can carry that forward, and we have some data now, into athletes potentially related to risk of injury. Um, and this may affect particularly women where bone mineral density, of course, can be a much more important issue. So to close out then, we've shown you that genes are important in determining performance and that you can actually identify these quite easily now. But perhaps the most obvious and relevant part of the genetics won't be in trying to select super athletes. It's going to be in identifying the mechanisms that cause injury because those of you that train elite athletes here tell me that your biggest heart sink is that you've got that person nearing peak of condition and then they get Achilles tendinosis or then they get an impingement and then they can't throw the javelin or they can't run the race anymore and then they're out of training and they try to come back and they just fail. If we could understand why it was those people were getting injured, it would demystify some of the training regimes. One might be able to say, well, actually, if we loaded you slightly differently, your Achilles would last. I'm not giving the game away here, so um, for lots of good reasons, we're keeping this under wraps. But here is a study we've got looking at stress fractures um, in a group of individuals doing um, elite training. Let's put it that way. And you can have an AA genotype, an AB, or a BB. And here's the control distribution, so this is the normal population. But again, you can see it's very, very different amongst those that get stress fractures during a standard period of training. And we've replicated these data now. So this will be a gene that we believe um, will give us a clue as to why some people get stress fractures and others don't. There aren't many other data out there. Um, this is one relating to the, um, a, a collagen gene for the A1 gene, which was purported to show a difference in genotype related to Achilles disease. I don't believe that it's actually as strong an association as might be for a number of reasons. But this is something with Marco and Mike and Ken that we've already initiated. So UCL is on the case now 
of getting a retrospective data set and a prospective data set of people with Achilles injuries. And we hope that it might take no more than about 18 months to be able to have found some of the mechanisms that are causing Achilles tendon injury. Um, this one, a little nod to our boxing and spinal injuries friend. Being whacked on the head isn't good for you, but how badly you do from being whacked on the head does seem to be impacted upon by variation in one gene, the dopamine D2 receptor, which is a neurotransmitter receptor in the brain. Same applies to APOE4. This is a, an allelic variant of a gene that regulates fat. Um, and it's been associated with dementia before. But again, traumatic brain injury in adults and boxers. So it's associated with worse outcome in all of these groups and with greater length of stay and so forth. So your response to being whacked on the head is partly determined by this genotype. Now again, that may have health and safety issues. It may be that if you're an E4 homozygote, you might want to recognise that you're at greater risk. But more importantly, it might be that this could be modified to lower risk. And finally, because I'm about to wrap, and I think just about on time, 20 minutes, there are other reasons to look other than just for the elite athlete. And I think it's important that we remember that because in two years' time when the Olympics is over, governments will not have the appetite, in my view, to be funding what they will see as uh, a potential frippery of elite athletes' behaviour. We've got to say studying elite athletes helps us take... Um, find design new therapeutic strategies that are applicable to you and I. And in very great brief uh, dis uh, description, if the ACE gene I allele is associated with efficiency of oxygen use, then you might expect patients who suffer this to do better. So if you look at adult or acute respiratory distress syndrome, these patients are profoundly hypoxic. What you'd be guessing is that II genotype is good and DD genotype like I've got is bad. And you'd be right. Uh, there is close on, just over in fact, a five-fold difference in mortality, which dwarfs anything that Mike and I would do on an intensive care unit. I can't influence mortality five-fold in these patients. A lot of whether they live or die is entirely down to genotype. And the same applies if you look at children with meningococcal septicemia. Uh, this is a study we did with Liverpool some years ago, where once again, the proportion who are on the ward and just stay there and survive compared to those that go to the paediatric intensive care unit and survive, compared to those that go to the paediatric intensive care unit and die. The proportion of a DD strongly tracks. So again, we can sell this, and it's not, a, it's not spin. We can sell this by saying we would never have got there had we not looked at the paper with Richard at Olympic Athletes, looking, working with Mike and Dan, looking at climbers, looking at the sprinters, looking at the military recruits. We'd never have got there had we not done those studies. So there you are, I'm going to end there. Uh, polymorph variation does influence athletic ability. We've got a couple of exemplars of it. And whilst this will help us understand how to train people, how not to break them in training, how to rehabilitate them better, it's also directly translatable, not just to young fit men and women, but to old ladies with osteoporosis, men with cancer and heavy smokers. Thanks very much indeed. Mike uh, is, is head of the Centre uh, for Altitude, Space and Environmental Medicine. He's done some amazing work, including, I think, some very, very impressive work on the Everest Exposition that I hope he's going to share with us today. Thank you for the invitation to talk, and, and uh, it's a real pleasure and a, and a privilege to have an opportunity to uh, tell you about the Caldwell Extreme Everest Project at the launch of the UCL Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. Cordwell Extreme Everest was a uh, UCL project, uh, UCL-led and UCL-centred, although it was an uh, international multi-centre collaboration. Uh, what Cordial, Cordial Extreme Everest was not, uh, in its aim, was a sports and exercise medicine project. It was act actually uh, designed and conducted in order to uh, understand more about hypoxia in the critically ill. Uh, uh, but what I hope you'll uh, see today is that the applications of both the approaches and the data that we derived uh, have huge potential utility in the fields of sports and exercise medicine. I'd like to sh start by showing you a short video. There's, a, there's unfortunately no sound, but I can, I can talk you through it to uh, illustrate to you how profoundly disabled uh, humans climbing close to the summit of Everest are. Uh, so this is a video taken with a helmet cam. If you could hear the soundtrack, uh, you'd not only hear all the wind on the microphone, but the, 
incessant ventilation at a rate of about uh, 60 breaths per minute uh, of the Sherpa who's carrying his head cam. That was just below the Hillary step. We're now on the, on the final ridge, probably the last 100 meters, uh, walking up towards the summit of Everest. And in a moment, you'll see an individual in a blue hat starting to walk, walk towards the camera. And to put this into context, at sea level, he's a, he's a county level uh, competitive fell runner. So this is an elite athlete you're looking at now. You'll note that he's, he's also using supplemental oxygen, but still struggling just to take a few steps on these last few meters uh, up to the summit of Everest. So, Everest, 8,848 metres, 29,028 feet, as you all know, the highest point on the surface of the Earth, but, but also, uh, by what must be coincidence, absolutely at the limit of what humans can tolerate uh, in terms of hypoxia, even when they've had a long time to adapt and acclimatise to this environment. The problem, as I'm sure you're aware, is hypoxia. So, there's a curvilinear relationship between the amount of oxygen available, illustrated here, we have barometric pressure on the horizontal axis, uh, inspired pressure of oxygen on the vert vertical axis, and altitude here. And to give you some context for the rest of the talk, at Everest Base Camp, around this central triangle here, there's about one half the oxygen available that there is at sea level. And at the summit of Everest, there's about one third the oxygen there is at sea level. So one half at base camp, one third at the summit. And if you acutely expose people to these levels of oxygen, so if we, for example, suddenly decompress this room, uh, we would rapidly lose consciousness. Altitude in metres here, time in minutes on the vertical axis, and around the summit of Everest, uh, we would have maybe one and a half to two minutes before we all lost consciousness. And yet we know that given sufficient time, humans can adapt to this environment. Uh, they can not only climb Everest with supplemental oxygen, this is uh, Sherpa Tenzing, photograph taken by Hillary when, on the first ascent in 1953, uh, but in fact, and it took a long time, but some individuals... Uh, some very unusual individuals are capable of climbing Everest without supplemental oxygen. And this is Reinhold Messner and Peter Habler who became the first to do that. And still to this day, only around 4% of all the individuals who have reached the summit of Everest have done so without using supplemental oxygen. Highlighting this point that it's very much at the limit of what uh, even very unusual individuals can tolerate. And we have uh, in the scientific literature a well worked out description of how people acclimatise to high altitude. And we know uh, that uh, there are a variety of changes that serve to increase the flux of oxygen from the atmosphere down to the cells where it's metabolised, turned into ATP, which is the universal energy currency and allows them to do work, walk, climb and exist. Uh, and that description has centred around these elements of oxygen flux. So you breathe more, you get more oxygen into your lungs, you have more haemoglobin, you can carry more oxygen in your blood. Uh, you probably increase the number of capillaries in the muscles, thereby reducing the distance that the oxygen has to diffuse. But unfortunately, although it's an accurate description, uh, it tends to have come from very small studies, and it does not serve uh, as an adequate explanation of what happens at altitude. And the reason I say that is if, if it did, we would be able to predict those who did well and those who did badly based on these variables. So you'd expect that the elite climbers would have the highest haemoglobins, the greatest capillary density, they would breathe the most, uh, and that's simply not the case. And, and perhaps counterintuitively, things, uh, variables like sea level fitness, so your VO2 max at sea level, are completely unrelated to your ability to perform well at altitude. And the perfect example of that is two individuals I've shown you already, Reinhold Mesner and Peter Habler, elite athletes in a mountain environment. Uh, they've been very extensively studied uh, and the bottom line is the most remarkable thing about them is how unremarkable they are. Their physiology is pretty much the same as your average, uh, in these graphs here, your average Swiss couch potato who was used as a control in these studies. So there's nothing amongst their, within their physiology ex that explains their ability to perform in such an extraordinary way. And perhaps even more surprisingly, and again counterintuitively, individuals who have uh, had sufficient time to acclimatise actually have a normal level of oxygen in their blood. So if you focus simply on the darkest bars in this graphic, uh, this is data from our expedition in 2007, the darkest bars are oxygen content expressed in mils per litre, and in these uh, members of the climbing team who've had a long time to adapt uh, during their stay at base camp, their oxygen content uh, compared with sea level here is in fact elevated at base camp, 5,300 metres, it's still elevated at 6,400 metres, 
and even at 7,100 metres, way above the height of any mountains uh, except in the Himalaya, uh, their oxygen content is still at sea level values, but their exercise capacity is dramatically reduced. So at base camp, for example, it will be down by about a third, and I'll show you some of that data in a moment. So their adaptation, which has uh, caused a decrement in their performance, is not actually related to their oxygen content, and yet that's the story that we've been sold over the years. And so our core hypotheses, and you can see how these would translate over into the environment of critical medicine, were that the changes that we would see would not simply be related to oxygen delivery, and that's self-evident from what I've told you already, but they would be related to more subtle physiological mechanisms, so perhaps changes in the microcirculation, uh, perhaps problems with diffusion, but, but much more intriguingly, some cellular or subcellular mechanisms uh, leading to changes in the efficiency of oxygen use. Uh, and a secondary hypoth hypothesis, and Hughes really uh, talked about this already, was that the variations between individuals that we would, that we would see, and we very deliberately did a very large study in order to be able to address that variability, uh, would be related to the underlying genetic differences between them. So we studied two distinct groups. Uh, the first was a group of trekkers who were predominantly altitude naive, uh, who trekked, they followed an identical ascent profile at different times, so uh, 13 different groups of 16 individuals who ascended to Everest Base Camp over 14 days, and we studied them in great detail at sea level here at UCL, and then at different altitudes along the way in laboratories that we had set up. Uh, and they provided the substrate to explore the variability in hypoxic ad adaptation. And the second group, uh, which are very clearly distinct, because these are people who have a uh, huge experience of, of altitude and therefore likely to be a little bit self-selected uh, and also ascended slightly slower, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little later, uh, were the investigators, or a subgroup of the 60 investigators that were involved. 24 of them followed the same ascent profile to Everest Base Camp. Some stayed there for nearly three months, giving us uh, a picture of what happens in prolonged exposure, uh, and some climbed higher on the mountain, uh, eight of whom reached the summit of Everest. This is the environment we were working in, so Everest Base Camp up here, uh, the Dude Cozy or River of Milk draining down towards the Himalayan Plain, and you can see the uh, overnight stops in blue, and the laboratories, the fixed laboratories we had on the way up to Everest Base Camp, highlighted in red. Uh, and this gives you a flavour of, of the environment we were working in. The two uh, large tents in the foreground are our laboratory tents. In the background you have uh, the logistics and medical tent. And then stretching away the Kumbu Icefall, uh, just about 900 metres of uh, very steep ice heading into the, the western Kuma of Everest and the higher reaches of the mountain. And because of the huge logistical uh, exercise that it was undertaken to achieve this expedition, we could uh, undertake at base camp almost anything that we could undertake at, at our laboratories here at UCL at sea level. So we're on 240 volts AC electricity. We have uh, standard exercise testing equipment, blood gas measuring capabilities. We can measure cardiac output, near-infrared spectroscopy, a whole variety of different physiological variables in this large group of subjects. And in the investigator groups, some very uh, much more invasive measurements, so involving intra-arterial cannulas, muscle biopsies, for example. Higher on the mountain, uh, we had a fixed camp, or fixed camps in four places, but two of those, Camp 2 and Camp 4, were also laboratories, and we spent considerable time there uh, exploring the investigators. And the highest measurements were made at 8,400 metres uh, on the balcony of Everest. This is the uh, Camp 2 fixed laboratory, uh, still on 240 volts mains and still able to make all, all these complex measurements. And then climbing above Camp 2, uh, up the steep Lake Sea face, you can see the Western Coombe, there's a, a climber just down there in the background, uh, to the South Col, so just under 8,000 metres, very few places on the surface of the Earth higher than this, uh, but still with a functioning laboratory, working laptops uh, and the like, and, and a, a huge series of measurements undertaken here. Now, we measured a very broad range of variables, and, and I'm certainly not going to bore you with all the different variables that we measured. They're listed here. I'm, I wouldn't bother trying to read it. Uh, and the consequence of that is that we have a vast amount of data, and we're slowly working through all that data. But what I'd like to show you today uh, is some of the exercise data uh, and some of the uh, biochemical uh, and metabolic data that underpins it. And one point I need to emphasize is that the difference between the trekkers and the climbers and their ascent profile becomes uh, very interesting when you look at this data. So the, the climbers, the investigators, ascended about three days slower to 5,000 metres, 5,300 metres than the investigators. The consequence of this, if you focus on the red bars in this graph, is that the oxygen content of the trekkers didn't actually have time to come back to the normal level that I showed you earlier on. So the trekkers 
oxygen content has fallen by about 10 or 15 percent because their increase in haemoglobin has not compensated for their fall in saturations at this point. If you look at their exercise capacity, on the horizontal axis we have our different laboratories from sea level to Everest Base Camp, and on the vertical axis, uh, oxygen consumption uh, in litres per minute. When they get to Everest Base Camp, the exercise capacity of these individuals has fallen by about 35%, and I'd like you to hold that figure in your head because it will recur with disturbing regularity in the next few slides. If we look at the investigators, their oxygen content, because they've had more time to ascend and acclimatise, is actually maintained uh, on their arrival at base camp, and in fact it's very clearly supranormal by the time they leave base camp. If we look at their oxygen uh, consumption, same pattern, London up to Everest Base Camp, some higher measurements, and then Everest Base Camp three months later, oxygen consumption of VO2 max on the vertical axis. At Everest Base Camp, their fall off in exercise capacity is about 35%. And when they leave Everest Base Camp with their supranormal oxygen content, the fall-off is still about 35%. So very little relationship, no relationship between the oxygen content and their oxygen consumption, suggesting strongly that there's something else underlying this adaptation. Now, in order to look at that, as I mentioned, we took some muscle biopsies, and we've had some of the preliminary results back from that. This is, uh, these are some of the proteomic plots uh, looking at the changes in different proteins and there are 23 proteins that across the investigators who had muscle biopsies are changed. And interestingly, they're predominantly down-regulated rather than up-regulated. And many of them are the sort of proteins involved in the, in the basic uh, biochemical processes of uh, glucose and fatty acid metabolism that you might suspect would be involved. If we look even deeper, and this is again data from the muscle biopsies looking at mitochondrial function, there are clear changes in some of the mitochondrial complexes, notably complex 1 and complex 4, in individuals who are adapted to altitude, supporting this idea of a, of a metabolic mitochondrial change uh, that, that's allowing acclimatization. Uh, trying to relate the functional to the metabolic, this is, uh, on the, this is heart cardiac data. Uh, transthoracic echo on this side, so before, immediately after, and six months after return from Everest. And what we see is a fall off in diastolic function on the transthoracic echo. So if you saw this in a patient, it would look like heart failure, but these individuals just walked back from Everest Base Camp. And, excuse me, and corresponding to that, a change measure, measured using functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, in their phosphocreatine ATP ratio. So a metabolic correlate of a functional change. Uh, and in itself, this is interesting, because as far as we know, it's the only uh, inducible, reversible model of cardiac failure that there is. And there are changes in skeletal muscle energetics with... Uh, differences post-Everest in inagonic phosphate levels and ADP levels. Uh, possibly most intriguing uh, from this perspective is that before they started the expedition, the climbers seemed to be different from the trekkers. And that was unexpected to us. Uh, but the resting muscle uh, inorganic phosphate levels were in fact uh, 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 higher in the climbers than they were in the trekkers. So presumably reflecting a degree of self-selection. You don't go back to altitude if you have a bad time the first time but, but a, a metabolic marker of that selection. I'm going to close by showing you uh, one of the uh, unique measurements that we made high on the mountain uh, that is an example of the very edge of uh, human physiology. Uh, this is our uh, summit photograph. We managed to get eight of the climbers, two of our film crew, and 15 Sherpas at the top of Everest, but the conditions were uh, somewhat inclement, so we had about minus 25 degrees, 20 knots of wind, uh, and we therefore took the judgment that, that taking any samples in, that, in those conditions were, was, were probably not wise. Uh, but we were able to descend about 400 metres uh, to this structure known as the balcony, uh, erected a small shelter and took four femoral arterial blood samples there, uh, which were uh, then run down to our camp two. Uh, they were measured there in a normal benchtop blood gas machine that you'd find in any of the intensive care units in the hospitals that you'll be familiar with, and we were very fortunate to get this published in the, the New England Journal of Medicine. And I'll take you through the results step by step. On the horizontal axis, we have the uh, arterial PO2, so the level of oxygen in the arterial blood in kilopascals. Normal is about 12 to 14. On the vertical axis, the CO2, normal is about 4 to 5. So this is a set of normal values that would be typical of any of us in this room now. The red line, the vertical red line, is where we would start to get nervous. I'm, I'm a critical care physician by day, where we could start to get nervous in patients. So if patients' oxygen level falls, falls below 8, we would initially give them supplemental oxygen, and if they get sicker and sicker, we'd be putting them on a mechanical ventilator. 
all our subjects at Everest Base Camp will comfortably be below the red line. And as they get higher and higher, and these individuals are functioning perfectly normally, they're undertaking complex experiments, they're communicating, they're moving around the mountain, uh, their oxygen level, not surprisingly, is getting lower and lower in the face of normal function. Uh, to the highest measurements, uh, which I'll show you here, uh, with the lowest measurement of oxygen being uh, around at one sixth of what one would normally see in a human, so about uh, 19 millimetres of mercury, just over uh, around 2.3 kilopascals compared with 12 normally, in a perfectly normally functioning individual who happens to be sitting in this room, it's certainly not me, uh, and, and as far as I know has functioned normally since. Now this brings some uh, intriguing questions to mind. When we searched the literature for equivalent for any parallels when we came back, uh, we, we could not find any in adult humans. So there are no clinical data that are, uh, have patients with levels any, uh, anything like this level. Most of us have experience uh, of it, but only in the peri-arrest situation, so in patients who are being actively resuscitated. Uh, you can intriguingly, in diving seals, when they surface, you find a similar level of oxygen, and one would imagine that diving seals evolve to get that judgment about when to surface right, or they wouldn't evolve much longer. And the other situation where it exists has happened to all of us, and that's the fetus in utero. Uh, and this was postulated uh, in the 1930s by a gentleman called Joseph Barcroft, the idea that humans on the summit of Everest would be physiologically very similar to humans on, uh, in uh, the fetus in utero. And it raises the interesting idea that what may be happening that allows people to get there is simply a reactivation of fetal mechanisms that simply allowed you to thrive uh, in the uterus. And we've been, uh, Dan Martin's been fortunate to publish this hypothesis in one of our premier critical care journeys, journals uh, only this week. So I will leave it there. Uh, I hope we have an opportunity to maybe explore some of the translational parallels in the discussion uh, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. To find out more about UCL, please visit us at itunes.ucl.ac.uk. Thank you.